So I'm Rob Wypond. I recently wrote a book called Your Consent is Not Required, The Rise in Psychiatric Detentions, Forced Treatment, and Abuse of Guardianships. I've been a journalist uh, writing off and on about mental health civil rights, I, I would say, for about 20 some years. And that kind of all built up into this book eventually. And one of the main things I try to do in the book is really show the wide spectrum of society who are being affected by these laws. A lot of media coverage really focuses only on specific segments of the homeless population, often a caricature even of a psychotic, dangerous man running about the streets, talking to himself and how we're gonna have to help him. That's the typical portrayal. And although I do cover that and it's an important sort of uh, topic area to delve into, I try to show in the book that he, mental health laws, forced treatment, involuntary treatment, uh, psychiatric detentions, all of these things are affecting a much wider spectrum of society and are used in a much wider spectrum of situations. So that's kind of the, the, the core part of, of what the book is about. We've been finding it especially helpful considering how many, I mean, you, you bring in so many data points um, into these conversations, many, many people who are affected by these intersections, um, it coincides with the kinds of trauma or neurological injury or, or similar that prevents people from being able to organize and speak to the data points, even when they know them, even when they've experienced them. Um, so for instance, part of my experience has been having this really deep and detailed understanding of what's happening to me, but because of the neurological injuries for a very long time, for many years, um, I was only intermittently able to communicate in the kind of data that people needed, and then I'd be wiped out again. And so I'd have to start all over. Um, you put a lot in this book that we need people to be aware of. Um, yeah. And wonderful read. Thank you for saying that. And and yeah, you know, to be honest, so many people are saying that to me Good. that, you know, I kind of wish I'd done more because I could have been even more vigorous. You, in can, some you, can, you can write that. another could, book. Yeah, yeah. Another <laughs> book. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's such a good point. I, I, as you know, the, the first chapter of the book after the introduction where I talk about my own father's experience of forced treatment, the first chapter is called Stolen Voices. And that's really this theme. And it cuts right across everyone who's had this experience. So even people who you don't have any kind of background of neurologic, other neurologic conditions they may be experiencing or disabilities of any kind or anything like that, even those people experience this thing you're talking about of the profound and immediate way in which their credibility, their capacity to speak out because these medications are so powerful. Or uh, in my my father's case, it was electroshock treatment. And that was so devastating to his his cognitive abilities and his his daily capacity just to survive. Without my mother, he, you know, I have no idea what would have happened to him. He had such a strong support structure. And so, you know, and he was previously a college professor of computer engineering. So yeah, this is a really common widespread phenomenon in this space where people are being often pulled into the system. Maybe they already are struggling in some way, genuinely. Certainly some people are struggling with one thing or another in their lives, and they maybe even they're reaching out for help. And then they get sucked into the system where they lose all their agency, all their power and control and, and rights and freedoms, and, and then get subjected often to treatments, which are are even more uh, debilitating to the point that they lose their uh, voice entirely. And as as you know, like a lot of these people then, when they get labeled with a psychiatric condition of some kind, some serious mental illness, quote unquote, then often other people just dismiss them out of hand. Like, oh, you know, you're, you've are you been locked up. Why would I listen to anything you say? Why would I believe anything you say? And that's really been devastating to any kind of reform or, or you know, uh, improvements in, in in this field. Well, one of the things that we try to highlight as often as we can is that if you have structures of care, um, structures that 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 um, are uh, are are put forward as scientifically based, um, that are put forward as helpful to the, and you you write about this quite a bit in the book. Um, if if 
if there are groups of people whose voices in terms of their negative experiences are being silenced, you're not getting the whole picture of what's going on. And so people end up feeling um, very, 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 a very good sense of that there are these resources out there, there, there are experts out there, there are suicide helplines out there. And, and, you know, we, we feel more stabilized because our, our society has these things to help people who, who may be experiencing difficult times. Um, but if people are trying to speak up about t terrible things that have occurred and they're not being listened to and their experiences aren't being integrated into the research data that's being considered into the marketing messaging that's being promoted, um, we, we're, we're out of kilter. We're, we're lopsided. We, we have a big problem. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you're, yeah, it's a very good point. And, and you mentioned earlier the data points, you know, for anyone who hasn't read the book, you know, we can talk about a few of those data points that I, I bring up in the book and explore. And that is that completely changed the common dominant narrative that's out there. And one of them is that, yeah, psychiatric detentions have been going up for decades in across North America, both in the United States and Canada, and quite dramatically. And it's contrary to the common belief out there that, oh, hardly anyone gets forcibly treated anymore. It looks like maybe more people are being forcibly treated today than ever in history, uh, or is certainly detained. We don't really have numbers on how many are actually being forcibly treated, but we do have numbers on how many are being detained. And then also the bed numbers. So I show that commonly what people are just counting are only state hospitals in America. And certainly those have were closed since the 1950s through the 60s and 70s, by and large, but they have been replaced and, and they've been replaced by group homes, assisted living, nursing homes, all these other types of facilities, as well as general hospitals, psychiatric wards, private hospitals. So we have this huge uh, array of different types of beds that have been funded since the 1950s that have largely replaced. And even I show per capita, we seem to have more beds more psychiatric beds than we had back in the 1950s. So that's where these people are being put. And so when you understand those two key data points, then you have a whole new picture of what's happening rather than this terrible, you know, supposed terrible lack of, of treatment and lack of aggressive treatment for populations out there. No, we're forcibly treating, we're detaining people at astronomical rates and continuously rising. And so we need that in the public narrative, <laughs> just right. that, like people need to say, okay, if that's what's happening, then what? Let, let's have a conversation about that. Cause we've been having a conversation about a lie for several decades. And, and the aggression, you know, it, the need for aggressive treatment, the aggression has gone off the rails, but the people experiencing the brunt of that aggression are not heard from or not recognized or not taken seriously. And that that's that's part of the tangle of all of it that we've been working so hard to address. Exactly. I mean, I thought of that constantly as I worked on the book. You know, if I'm quoting a Harvard professor about X, Y, or Z, I know, okay, any average reader reading this is going to, oh, well, you know, he's a Harvard professor. He's not going to lie or whatever, you know, there's a certain way in which that reputation and that the association, association with that reputable institution is linked to credibility in our society. And then I knew, oh, anything that one of the people I'm interviewing who's been locked up and forcibly treated, any interview with them, the reader's going to go, why should we believe anything this person says, right? And, and I, I just knew that was going to be in, in editors' minds and readers' minds. And so I constantly had to grapple with that to say, okay, what am I going to have to do to try to compensate for that so that readers will take these people seriously? seriously the people who've been through the experiences i took them seriously i you know but of course with anyone you're talking to you always have to go well yeah like are they exaggerating a little are they remembering correctly do they have any possible reason why they might want to mislead you on something so you always have to check these things and so but i always always knew throughout the book that i had to do two or three times as much work on that right with with people who've been locked up just because they've been locked up right not for any other reason 
And, and yeah, and that's what I did. And I will say that to people that in a lot of cases, I had medical records that would, well, to be honest, my experience of this is that often psychiatric patients are far better uh, um, truth tellers and, and have far better recall of events that happen when I start comparing multiple sources of documentation. It's often amazed me how doctors, I think they have an agenda to distort in a way that the patient doesn't. Because if the patient really did get better, they'd say, I got better, right? If they didn't, they have a very clear recollection of why they feel that way. Whereas the doctors are often seem to be trying to mislead themselves because they did it. They perpetrated the force and they want to believe that it helped. And so I would find that their recollection, if I was entering them, often wouldn't correspond to their own medical records, you know, let alone other things I could corroborate in these stories, right? Or independent third parties that waited in like a judge, a court case, something like that. Well, the, there's a tremendous amount of pressure in professional networks and people don't even realize how much pressure they're under until they're in a situation where they're saying what they say. And we, when we look at the, the different behaviors and circumstances around doctors, um, around psychiatrists, around other care professionals too, it depends a lot on what's going on in that person's professional network because there's there's... Um, there are patterns of abusiveness that are perpetuated through professional environments that have really been normalized for professionals in order to be a professional. It's been normalized for them to put up with a certain amount of what is essentially abusive behavior. If you if you really look at it, people say, well, this is how I accomplished what I accomplished. This is how I have made my career because I have a thick skin and I, I can I can handle it. But if they wittingly or unwittingly are passing on some of those patterns to the people they're caring for or they're making statements that are um that that are that are being put forth with the authority with the heft of that whole professional system um some people realize and some people don't i'm sure um what what a huge impact that can have on on the life of someone who is seeking care in those networks and i actually think a lot of doctors now a lot of care professionals now are realizing that they there are certain ways they've been set up to 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 be delivering the antithesis of the care they went into their profession in order to provide to people yeah, I think you're hitting there on one of the key reasons why this issue has been so polarized and continues to be. I talk with uh, lots of people who had recently been through psychiatric residency training programs, and I started to realize that the training for it is actually quite militaristic. And by that, I mean that uh, you can't graduate, you can't become a psychiatrist unless you administer force and do it a lot. Like you you are months at a time stationed in certain facilities during your residency period where you must administer it. And not only do you have to administer it, but you have to administer it the way your supervisor would do it. Otherwise you fail. So you can't even do your own instinct. You can't say, hey, I don't think this person needs to be forcibly treated right now. It, because if you're thinking, but my supervisor would, you have to follow the protocol unless you have a very, very compelling argument that you're willing to yes. stand up. Right. And that that's your whole investment. That's your family's investment. That's your community's investment. People are counting on you. Goosebumps all over my body. I um, So I'm a bit torn. Because I came into this recording with four major questions. I was like, we'll spend this hour. We'll we'll talk about four major questions. We'll keep it simple. No, you and I have a huge amount of stuff that we want to talk about, obviously. Um, so I I let's see, we've been recording for um about 15 minutes, I think. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll, is I'll take us back to my questions and then um yes, um I would love to record more going forward. Um, yeah, our community can. has so much that that we could bring into conversation with you that would that would make very helpful public media for our outreach, um, for people who don't realize yet how this stuff is going on, for people who really want to be able to communicate with people in their lives who have survived hardship 
like this is highlighting, but they don't know how to communicate with people who have experienced it. I think your book is a huge step in that direction. Yes, thank you. And and as we roll into back into your question, so there's just one thing I want to raise because, you know, maybe a lot of your listeners already know this, but for those who don't, I really want to highlight uh, just for a minute or two what forced treatment even is, because some people don't even really know. They kind of have a picture vaguely in their mind of, oh, you know, you're taken to hospital and at first you're disagreeing, but they talk with you, they treat you respectfully and and they ask you if you'd like to try medication, you say yes and 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 it works out and you're happy and they're happy. And, you know, and it's not that that never happens. That does happen. And, and if forced treatment has to occur, that would be the ideal that you're treated, still treated respectfully. And, you know, you you have dialogue and discussion and you you experiment. And if you don't like something, you have the freedom to say no. And they they try something else, whatever. But but unfortunately, that is not really what my book's about. And that is not really the most common experience as near as we can tell. Uh, much more common is, is uses of restraint. Uh, people are tied down in gurneys. They may be protesting. Or, as soon as you're protesting or resisting in any way, you may say, I've tried this drug. It harms me. I don't like it. It doesn't help. And they say, too bad. And now they're stripping you against your will. They're forcibly injecting you with needles. They're you also they lock you in seclusion it can be a very very traumatizing experience for people and that's by and large what i'm writing about in the book is that people are having these kind of experiences sometimes repeatedly and how destructive that can be and unhelpful so i just wanted to clarify that for those people out there who may not have had this experience or, or realize it that yeah it's like that. And um, that's excellent context for the, the four questions that I have from our community um, are about how um, people have a sense of suicide helplines being a, a, a stable resource in, in their communities. Um, and there are things happening to people who trust suicide helplines that, that we wanted to draw out in some of these questions. Um, the first question that we wanted to ask you is, for whom is it safe to call a suicide helpline when they're thinking or feeling about subjects related in some way to suicidality? So that is unfortunately, it's it's a real issue. It's a real problem. You got to be very careful. I'd say really it's only safe if you know in and out exactly what the policies and practices are around that. But you can't really know that because it varies so much from call center to call center. When you call 988, you're routed to a, a particular call center that you may or may not know which one it is. And, and also it can vary from volunteer to volunteer. But essentially the policy of the 988 line as written says that if you're at imminent risk they may put pressure on you to reveal your location or they may contact 911 to do uh, a variety of different methods they can use to trace your actual location against your will or knowledge you may not even be aware this is happening so and then typically the police and or ambulance would show up to your house they technically have the ability to make their own assessment and call in that situation. But usually it's if the 988 line said this person needs to see somebody, police would usually take you into a psychiatric hospital or a general hospital emergency ward for an assessment. And so you're sucked into that system. So people need to know that occurs. And the latest data that I've seen particularly on people who are calling with suicidal feelings is these numbers are really high. The typical number that's out there publicly is about 2% of calls have something like this happen to them, either with or without the knowledge or consent of the caller, which itself is a very large number. When you're talking about the millions who contact the line, this can be tens of thousands of people per year. So it's a huge number and should not be discounted as rare. However, it's far, far higher among suicidal callers. So the best data I've seen from a particular large call center, put it, it looks like it can vary. It varies a lot, but it's anywhere from 6% to 20% 
of people calling with suicidal feelings will have this happen. So really disturbingly high rates. So I'd say if you're feeling suicidal, you need to be really careful when you call 988. And of course, that's the that's the time when you're you it's it's difficult to be careful because you need care. <laughs> you need care from others. Um and one of the things that your that your book highlighted really wonderfully for us um, the 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 addendum to that question or the second question is what about when when someone is thinking or having feelings about death about their vulnerability or about their own mortality not necessarily saying I'm feeling suicidal or I feel like I might I just want to talk about like what what being suicidal means that's one thing that's like the word suicide has been broached but in these situations where the word suicide is never broached, but someone's existential experiencing of, of what's going on for them in whatever way is interpreted by the person on the other end of the line as being a cause for forced intervention due to suicide risk. And if you could say more about that, I'd, I'd be very grateful. Yeah, well, it's important to understand that it's not only suicidal callers that this is happening to. So they, they may make an assessment that you just sound like you're at risk in some way of harming yourself or being harmed in some way because, you know, just the way you're talking or the uh, you may, you know, the harm to self or others. The same broad ways in which that's applied in mental health settings can be and often are applied in, in on the 988 line as well. So that's important for people to understand that, that there's a variety of things you might say that might signal, oh, we're concerned. And one of those ways is a third party can even call and say, I'm worried about my friend and this can precipitate such an intervention. So you want, it's, it's really, you know, it, it's this point where you go, are we living in some weird police state right around thought control here? Because, you know, just the, the paranoia it can create is extreme. And of course, it, it is still a relatively smaller percentage, but it's a, it's a real concern for those of us who may feel more victimized. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question there. I think um, you are. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah it, it, it's, a, it's a concern the, of all the things. So what I would say to people, if you still, you know, of course, there's Lots of people who call 988 and have a 10 or 15 minute chat and do feel better. You know, they say, oh, yeah. It, it, and of course, there are people who call it actually talk about suicidal feelings and and then just come away feeling better. and Nothing like this happens. So that can and does happen. And what I'd say is if you're wanting that and if you're needing that for some reason, you can't afford a counselor, you know, all these reasons that people might call 988. I just say be mindful. And, and there are a few cues that you can use where you could just lie and that will help a lot. And that is, there'll be a moment where they'll say, they'll suggest something like, could you make some sort of agreement with me that you're going to do X or Y over the next day or two to make yourself feel better, to make yourself less suicidal? Just flat out lie at that point. Say, oh yes, great idea. I'm going to do that. I'm going to you know, call my mother and tell her how much I love her and appreciate her. And perhaps I'll go stay with her tonight. You know, Whatever it is, something that they might be proposing, it's usually improvised in the moment based on what you've shared with them. But things like that. So just you know, never say, yeah, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it shortly because you know then you're off the rails with these people right so it, it's like there are these little cues they'll look for to just signal to them that you're doing something to keep yourself safe and that you don't have a plan of actually doing it and in fact the best thing to say is you just wouldn't know how you do it don't ever tell them that they'll always ask you that how would you do it just say yeah i have no idea i've never really thought about it in detail just flat out lie about that and then you can probably tell the truth about everything else because the do you have a plan question is absolutely key to how they make these kinds of assessments so uh, i'm sure that you have traveled through a lot of feeling states about I mean like what you just what you just said um I mean just like I gotta sit with that for a minute because of course that's what we know that's what we know that people have had to do and and actually the the next question I was going to ask you was when we are having those most challenging experiences how do we evaluate how and whether to reach out to a suicide helpline? Like, is there any way of evaluating that? And what, what we have found is that there has not been a way to evaluate it once people are really 
struggling. They do not have family members or community members they can reach out to. They cannot reach out to their professional colleagues for whatever reason. They're in a position where they are really vulnerable to the kinds of procedural, ah, whoa, I don't know what word to use. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Procedural. Um, yeah, the protocol or something. Yeah, the proceed. I know what you mean exactly, because I was going to yes. say that myself. So we're thinking together here. I want to add to the yeah, What? I hiccups, toxicity, tangles, um, pre predator. Well, I mean, predatoriality comes into it. Um, in the intuitive network, we have many, 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 many community members, um, including myself, against whom wellness checks had been weaponized, where where people can knowingly or unknowingly do a tremendous amount of damage to your body and your life by calling and having someone check on you. And that may instantaneously turn into a forced intervention. And so when I was trying to report sex trafficking activities in my communities, I didn't even get the chance to start because some of the people who had an investment in, in me not being um, recognized or, or heard or understood used wellness check after wellness check to 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 I mean they really destabilized me I was um I was already uh, uh severely disabled I was already experiencing severe neurological injuries and the wellness check stopped me from sleeping um and they made it they made it a lot less safe for me in my location because there were people who um who who would behave worse in terms of if there were if there were police or if there were social services around i could get in trouble with some of the people who were preying upon me um and so no one would listen to me so that was weaponized against me in that way um but people all over the network talk about how that is used by people who either just feel that like, you know, this is the only thing to be done. This is this is all we know how to do. We don't know how to help our friend. Um, so we we call to have a wellness check. Um, or it's used by people who are exercising a privilege of not having to deal with that situation. And they don't really, they don't necessarily care a whole lot what happens. It's also used by perpetrators um, in order to to get people in lockup on purpose um, so that they won't listen to. Yeah, I want to, and I want to say, uh, you were one of the first people to point this out to me. And I have since, you know, had ample opportunity to verify that what you're saying is actually true. And I think for listeners out there who don't understand that sex trafficking is part of this system, really need to understand that it is, right? Because of course, it is not uncommon also that people in heightened states going through struggles uh, may uh, use metaphorical language to say that they're being sex trafficked when in fact, you know, it may still be a bad situation, but they're using terminology for, you know, saying that they have this strange relationship, you know, with their, with the way their husband or wife is treating them where they feel like they're being trafficked, but it's not literal. So that happens and we know that. And of course, some people can, right, either through drug induced experiences like these prescription drugs can induce hallucinations, they can misinterpret it. So these things happen too, which makes it hard to get it, get into really understanding all this. However, we also have cases on the books of the Department of Justice finding mass scale institutionalization situations where people were being sex trafficked at the same time. And th this was essentially a criminal operation masquerading as a recovery home, as a psychiatric institution where everybody was involved. As the Department of Justice lawyer said to me, it's like an assembly line of fraud where all of the, the all the staff are involved in it right up to the owner of the facility and they're all getting kickbacks and making lots of money. That's the drive in this and they're just criminals that's what they are but they have this veneer uh, where they're allowed to use mental health laws to entrap people and they have this veneer in the community as oh this is like a nice institution it's very not at all dissimilar to how 
the Catholic Church and other churches were engaged in systemic abuse for years, uh, hidden under the guise of being these reputable, caring institutions. Is so yes, this is going on. So I really want to affirm what you're saying for people out there who you know who may not realize this, and that we have not just one case but numbers of cases. And the Department of Justice is very clear; they think they're just scraping this, the surface of it. Of course, because if, if once they're on it, they're usually on it. But it can take them years to 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 fully uh, prosecute these kind of cases to get all the evidence they need precisely because of what we're talking about earlier, which is often the people who are being victimized are being discredited as well, even as they may be launching complaints and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, there's a fascinating case coming out of uh, Denver, to my knowledge, not involving sex trafficking, but clearly fraud, a mass scale fraud, locking up patients against their will for prolonged periods, merely to bilk insurance and make money. And and this mainstream, um, mainstream ABC News in Denver were hitting on it for a couple of years, like covering repeatedly what was happening at this hospital, scandal after scandal after scandal. And it took that long before the government finally did shut the place down. You know, even though like there were staff members speaking out about it, lots of family complaints on the record, lots of patient complaints on the record, just all of it was being discredited and dismissed until just this constant battery from mainstream media organization and finally, the medical director himself, a new medical director, had stepped in. He became a whistleblower in the situation. It was like, okay, we can no longer deny the actual medical director. So they finally shut the facility down, you know? But that's what we're dealing with right now is the scale and scope of this is just really, really disturbing. One of the things that, that we use to anchor ourselves in this is that what, what we have is um, we have a set of structures that has been prolifically marketed as caring, as, as responsible, um, and a lot of money has been put into that. So, so that has an effect. It really expands the influence of it. And these structures, which are helpful to some people, which some people have had experiences that were positive, in these structures. Um, at the same time, the very structures are providing, uh, uh, the, they're, they're providing tool sets and a sort of substrate to perpetrators who can use them very freely uh, for criminal activities without any, I mean, in, in many cases, without risk of anything being done about it, because of the ways that character assassination is automatically used on people who are victimized by it. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's really concerning. And I think the most concerning part of this, in a way, for me, is that it's you and I raising this and not psychiatric professionals like the American Psychiatric Association the the, nur the psychiatric nurses association like these professional organizations they should be the ones really raising the alarm about this because they should be saying hey we want to do good that's our intention we got to you know weed out these bad apples as it were right that's that at the very least that's what we should be hearing from them they should be constantly you know, aggressively promoting that this is happening, letting people know, warning families and patients to be on the watch for this, you know, helping monitor these kind of situations, participating with the Department of Justice. But instead, we're seeing the exact opposite happening. These major institutional organizations are not really helping at all. They're rarely speaking out about it. If people like you and I start raising the alarm, and we can point now to some of these Department of Justice cases to say, look, here's the evidence, you know, that's been in the courts and all of that, even then we're, we're dismissed, right? And, and that's a real problem. And that to me is the most concerning because it, it does make you say, how widespread is this? And why wouldn't these people care about this and be all constantly concerned about it? Because it's exactly as you say, like we've created these very broad, very powerful laws that allow people without charge of any criminal offense, without doing anything wrong, merely because we're supposedly trying to quote unquote help you, we can utilize these laws to take away all your rights and freedoms, completely discredit you, lock you up, and, and then you're behind closed doors in a way where even people who really care about you may, may may get blocked from being able to visit you or see you. I see this happen all the time. And so the abuses in this kind of environment could clearly be rampant. And so anyone who's running that kind of space 
should be super concerned about making sure that doesn't happen, making sure. I mean, we have this case down in, uh, it was uh, Arkansas, I believe it was. I don't want to say the state because I can't remember right now, but one of the states in the South. And and they had the institutions, the government institutions, so the state hospital had actually barred lawyers from entering the institution for years. So even though federally that these lawyers were federally mandated to enter the facility, make sure things are okay, talk with patients there, do investigations. They were forcibly blocked from the facilities by the government and by the state hospital. And they had to sue in court to get allowed back in again. And that took years. And you just go, what, what is going on here, right? It's just, it's off the rails that that would happen. And this is not like something I just found myself. It was in the news, it was covered, it went to court, you know, everything else. Does, does does that seem governmentally psychotic to you? <laughs> like that, like there's a there's a there's an immediate conflict in what is what is actually going on. People are required to do things this way, and they are blocked from doing things this way. And I mean, there there certainly is a, a level of cognitive dissonance that can prevent any remedy from occurring in a situation like that. But for 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 any of us who wish to celebrate the true scientific method, um, we would not want to be wiping out a massive portion of of the evidence for or against if we wanted to 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 look at something and say we you know this is grounded this is evidentially grounded. Um, you, we have to consider all the evidence and and we have to hear all of the voices of people who have experiences with those systems and those modalities because if we're not doing that um oh my gosh it's so violent for so many people and it's it's sort of a dream state that 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 communities end up in where where and i mean i i was in i was in this dream state and i didn't really know it before i experienced the levels of violence that unfolded in my communities about um eight eight, eight or nine years ago um, I thought we had support systems and the people around me thought we had support systems. And so we focused on our work and we focused on building our relationships. And we thought, you know, like society has some good structures for, for dealing with hardship and, oh, like there are problems over there and, oh, well, there are problems here in the community and we're working to address those things, but we're on it. We're talking about it. We, we have inclusive dialogues. We discuss consent. Um, we discuss um, a, a grounded scientific approach to solving problems. And it turned out that a lot of that stuff was not true in my community because when I and, and many, many others, when, when we've encountered um, really serious situations, we found out suddenly that those structures don't work as advertised. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's it. There's a real threat. I mean, they may, right? Occasionally you may luck out and get a good social worker who's, you know, working with you or a good doctor, good psychiatrist, whatever, who's, who's willing to collaborate with you. That, that does happen. And we don't want to say it never does because, you know, people report that it does. So, yeah, but like you say, the, the main problem here is by and large, though, the that patient voices, people who are in these experiences, people who are being made into patients, don't have a voice. They and, and systemically they don't, even though it's widely recognized as best practice in the field that they would, that you know, most most states, most provinces in Canada will have policies on the record that say, hey, you know, uh, peers, patients. They should be involved in policy making and decision making. You know, their input should be valued. It's all been tokenized in most places. And so they really don't have influence. And that would make a tremendous difference. That alone, we wouldn't even have to change the laws. All the other things we could do, we wouldn't have to do right off that. We could change things quite radically if simply tomorrow, all the peers, patients, uh, people who'd been through these experiences, people who lived experiences at these institutions and, and formerly at these institutions basically had some sort of 
significant, meaningful influence in how policies and practices were implemented in these institutions. It would be radically different because they do. A lot of people I talk with, like yourself, right, who are um, who have been through these experiences, are, are entirely capable of actually uh, making suggestions that are really helpful for how to improve these systems. And if you were listened to and appreciated and valued and empowered, uh, that would be great. And you would probably appreciate it right then you'd become fully more collaborative with these institutions and say hey i understand the struggles you're having too uh, you're hearing me that's great how can we find the common ground that's going to make this better for everybody and we're just not there we're not there at all as common sense as that sounds <laughs> this is an amazing conversation it's a very it's a it's a painful conversation um, it's also a conversation full of opportunities and 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 one one kind of opportunity that it's full of is is the kinds of opportunities we have when we build real relationships with one another. So so what we're talking about is we're talking about we would like these systems of care to be in true relational integrity with us not 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 a relation I, if if someone's trying to force me to do what they want me to do and they're not listening to me they're not really in relationship with me i'm not really part of the relationship and um i i would like to um so so you talk about 988 a lot um and and we talk about 911 in various circumstances but of course there are a lot of different um, outreach. Uh, there, uh, there are a lot of different um, like phone numbers or ways that people can contact assistance that can result in the kinds of things we're talking about. And I, I would like to highlight that quickly before going on. But in, in terms of being in relationship, any of these services that says, do you, do you need help? Are you experiencing a, a, a really challenging circumstance? We're here to help you. They must truly be in relationship with us, and we've got to have some way of identifying whether that's the case. Can you name name some more of those kinds of helpline um, situations that 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 you have run across when you were doing this research? Well, so we know that there are often peer run warm lines. They might be called sometimes unofficially, where they don't engage in these practices. And we also know, for example, the Samaritans out of New York, the last I checked, uh, still have a policy. They don't trace calls. So you can call Samaritans in New York still uh, from anywhere in the country if you can afford it. And uh, I think they might have an 800 number, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, you know, so there are some and you have to investigate. You have to look up, you know, Look at their website, uh, flat and ask. Sometimes they're misleading about this. That's unfortunate. But, you know, usually at some point, if you really pointedly ask, you can get an answer to the question of would you ever do it? And if so, like what are the circumstances? But, you know, yeah. So there are some Wildflower Alliance out yes. of Massachusetts runs a line where they don't trace calls uh, against people's will at all. And so, yeah, there are some, there are others out there. I don't know them all at one point. There was a group working with the website Mad in America that were trying to get this information. They were surveying all sorts of call lines around the country asking these questions, but they just didn't get a lot of responses at all. So it was hard for them. You know, they found about 10 in the country, which I think are listed there. People want to go look at the, the 10 or so that said, yeah, we don't do this. Uh, they're on the Madden America website. But but yeah, it, it's something you kind of have to investigate in your community and, and find out. But basically anyone who's licensed, for sure, they're usually having to follow these kinds of protocols. So a social worker, a mental health professional, a doctor, there are some that don't, but they would be kind of telling you that on the side, you know, whispering it to you. Yeah, like I won't do that. <laughs> so that's the only way you're going to find out about it. I know some they've told me that, you know, but they're not advertising that. Obviously, they can get into trouble with their licensing bodies. So, yeah, so it's just you need to be mindful all the time. And of course, even among your own friends, now you got to know. So, I mean, the, the best that's the best advice I can give anyone is just, yeah, you got to develop those networks of, of friends one way or another. That's where I'd invest my time 
is, you know, just do your best to say like, and obviously you can trust someone who's been through that experience themselves and say, okay, I won't do this to you. You don't do it to me because <laughs> we both know how bad this can be. So, all right. And then we'll, we, you'll be one of the people I can call. And, and it's just that I think sometimes we burn each other out, right. By demanding too much of each other. But these call lines, they only talk to you for 10 or 15 minutes usually. So if that's all you ask of your friend, that's very manageable, you know? And so we could offer that to each other more readily. Well, part of what we we have highlighted in the network too, because in, in many ways, the network came together because there was nowhere safe to go to discuss what had to be discussed, whether it had anything to do with suicidality or not. Whether I mean, many, many situations where people's bodies are being killed by perpetrators, by um, compounded health conditions, um, by severe injuries that have gone unaddressed, where they're they're not receiving any kind of rehabilitative or recovery support, um, where people are are dying and then they're they're taken. They're, they're mistaken for talking about suicide when they're asking not to be killed. They're asking to have community. They're asking to have caring people around them. And one of the positions that, that we end up in, or we try not to end up in, because that's why we've built the resources of the intuitive network in the first place, um, is because, okay, well, you're having this really, really serious situation and you you don't know how you can even function. So do you do you do all of this research to try to find a helpline that will respect your needs as you describe them rather than forcing something on you? Do you do you do all this research to find a helpline that will not build a relationship with you? You will talk to a different person every time. And you don't get, you don't, often you don't get to know the person's real name. So it's not, there's no relationship building medicine as part of that. And without that, many people can never recover. And so the, the fourth question that we had written down here is something that we've already started talking about. What kinds of dialogues can we have with community members and family members and friends and colleagues who might expect that their loved one can reach out to a helpline um, when they're experiencing difficult times. And, and part of it is definitely refer them to your book, which we have been doing a lot. Um, but also, you know, how do we support one another to be in real relationships rather than having to do this huge amount of, of body destroying work for severely disabled people trying to figure out if it's safe to call a helpline is a huge amount of body destroying work. Wouldn't it be better for us to put our energy into building networks of real, honorable, respect oriented relationships and friendships and long term collaborations and community building? Um, so that's where I want to land for 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 the remainder of our conversation because that's what we've found is so crucial in all our lives. Yeah, and I really agree. And you know, I also do some volunteering and working in community-based development, asset-based community development is kind of the model that we're using in this space, bringing neighbors together to to support each other in different ways. And, and sometimes that can involve emotional support of some kind and other times very practical things. And, and of course, sometimes the practical and the emotional can overlap in really meaningful ways in people's lives. You just offer someone a little assistance in their day and they just feel so much better. Like, okay, I've got, you know, I've got a relationship with my neighbor that if in an emergency, you know, I, I feel comfortable knocking on their door and saying, Hey, you know, could you help me with this? And and yeah, and that that alone can be something that people then carry forward in their day, just knowing, oh, I have that, and it can make a big, meaningful difference. And so, yeah, I do think that's it. Like I personally wouldn't. I think I, I like call one of these lines, and I think that what's happened is we've professionalized this whole space, right? And and, and people can be forgiven for having these beliefs because they're being trained into it, right? Across our culture, children in schools are being trained to call 911 on each other, right? That's literally what we're doing right now to say, you know, if your friend's in distress and 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 these texts, these little, you know, 
curriculum that they give kids will say things like, oh, if you're depressed for more than two weeks, you know, you've probably got a biochemical imbalance in your brain and you better go see a professional. Like that's literally what it will say. And, and you're like, wow, like we're just inculcating these kids with, with fear, right? Around their own feelings. Like when I think back to my childhood and my teen years, like, wow, man, I would have been like, if the system was as aggressive then as it is today, I would undoubtedly have been locked up, right? So, so yeah, that's the the milieu we're in, and it's this professionalization. Like these programs measure their own success on: do we increase the number of children and teens who seek professional help? If we do, we have succeeded. They aren't measuring because they they don't take the time to measure. Do they actually feel better? Do they get better? You know, over the course of years, you know, all of that. But no, they aren't doing these studies that long. And when they do, they find these things can have very negative impacts. By and large, they're just measuring: Are we increasing the rate at which children are going to psychiatric hospitals seeking help, checking into emergency rooms, going to counselors, you know, calling therapists? Like, if they're doing that more, that's that's a positive as far as we're concerned. So therein lies the problem, right? That's a, so, that's a business metric. That's not a human metric. Exactly. In their minds, of course it is, but it's a human metric in their minds because, oh, they're going to get you know professional help. But we know from experience that that doesn't necessarily actually help. And therein lies the danger. So this professionalization in the whole space and 988 is part of that now. It's like, oh, you're going to get a trained. Often they're just volunteers anyhow. But, you know, the idea that they're trained and they're going to somehow help you at a level that your friend couldn't know. Like th this isn't real. It's not real. And so, yeah, I go back to as you do. What does it look like to rebuild our networks, to rebuild our communities, to rebuild our personal relationships, our professional relationships too, right? Our workplaces, where we're at, that, that there's more space to accommodate just the ability to talk, to share, uh, when we're facing challenges to just under, be understanding of each other and, you know, and, and work together, collaborate together more. That's definitely what we need. I appreciate also that that a minute or two ago you brought up um, the practical elements of solving problems in the community, um, because what we find overwhelmingly is that wherever there is anxiety or depression or suicidality, there are pretty big, unaddressed, practical, situational problems that no one is, is is rising to the opportunity to collaborate, to tackle these problems and, and implement solutions. Um, if we lose our sense of how to collaborate together, how to be respectful enough of one another and caring enough of one another that we can get things done together, if we lose our sense of how to implement practical solutions, um, we end up being swept into these well i mean what are what are basically very lucrative business operations and many of our community members they say full stop human trafficking um because it is extraction from the communities and populations who are affected if if we say wait a second our bodies are being harmed as part of this, and the 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 economic engines of it continue unabated. Hey, y'all, human trafficking. Let's not allow that to go on. Let's build real relationships where we solve problems together. And I'm I'm very interested, uh, you know, as we move into the future, to hear more about about the community building work that you mentioned. Yeah, and you know, there is a role. I think still there can be a role for professionals in that kind of a space, right? Absolutely. It's just what is that role? And I think it's just clearly more they should be not telling you what you need, right? Not going into these communities and saying, you know, okay, here's the solution for you, but rather asking people, asking you, asking me, asking these communities what is it you need? What would be helpful? And then trying to provide that, right? And because that can be useful because sometimes, yes, you know, we're not going to solve poverty 
only by helping each other. I do think it can make a huge difference, right? If we are there for each other, we share equipment and tools, you know, we, we share our skills with each other freely, you know, we can make a lot of headway that way. Ultimately, we are all still part of this broader economy right now. And, and um, extensive poverty in a community also could have a valuable professionalized response to, okay, how can we help this person? But it shouldn't be, we're going to go tell that homeless person what they need. It's rather what, ask the homeless person. And the best example of that, or one of the greatest ones on this issue of suicidality is this, that program that was run by the military where they decided to intervene and they decided to take an approach to suicidality, which was to intervene earlier with practical supports. So rather than waiting to the person, till the person was in a total crisis mode of, I'm, I feel Feel like killing myself now and then trying to intervene with mental health interventions earlier on they just communicate with lots of people who are in various states of distress and just said what, what would you need what would you help and they just literally gave people money they they gave them a counselor to help them with their marital problems you know or whatever it was just like they did intervene in these ways where the things that were causing people difficulty and stress in their daily lives that were just sort of practical and real for them by intervening early at that point and helping asking that person what would help you what and that helped that completely dramatically reduced suicide rates. And it's the best study we've had, as far as I know, anywhere for clear, demonstrable, large reductions in suicides in a larger population. And so that's the model that we're talking about. We're saying, okay, so that's great, where we could all be providing that kind of support to each other. And if there are professionals in the space, that's what they're doing. They're simply asking, what do you need? What can you help? Well, how, what can I help you with? And then they, they adapt to that. They don't just say, hey, well, I'm a mental health professional. That's what I'm giving you whether you want it or not, they say, okay, I am a mental health professional, but it sounds like what you really need is this. And then they're the liaison to the, the appropriate professional that, who can provide that kind of service or support, you know? Yeah. And I, I think that there's a really powerful role for existing professionals to strengthen the pathways by which people who have survived hardship become professionals at their intersections of experience. And that's something that we focus on in the network tremendously. Um, we, we, we treat one another as professionals. We, we call one another professionals or survivor professionals, or there are a lot of different ways that we refer to it. Um, because people who have had these hardship experiences are often being gaslighted to believe that they are of no value, they have none of their own expertise, they have no standing in the world, they should not be developing their own solutions, and it's the opposite of what is true. And of course, we're, we're in a world right now where there is more and more hardship occurring. People are having seriously traumatic experiences where they never expected something something like that to touch their life and so it becomes more and more important how are we responding to this um and i love your touch points for it mm -hmm. yeah as you were saying earlier too like we really need to flag how many uh bad things are going on in the world in the sense that it's creating anxiety depression you know you know one of the things i talk about in the book is how you know, even just a couple of nights without sleep, studies show that 50%, 70%, up to 100% of the population will end up experiencing psychosis, you know, in the sense of hallucinations and paranoia, and, and heightened experiences like that, uh, with just a couple of nights without good sleep, right? And so you then amplify that by, okay, now I'm homeless, you know, how often am I getting a good night's sleep as, as I'm living homeless on the street, you know? Okay, like, obviously, then I'm going to start going through intense anxiety, intense depression, intense uh potentially you know psychotic like experiences you know i don't like to call them that because i don't think necessarily they're always bad right they they, they can be very enlightening experiences sometimes these uh, unusual states we get into so i don't want to say any of them no one should ever have these experiences but i am saying clearly people are really suffering uh, too much from these experiences without assistance and and a lot of the times it's being caused by 
nothing to do with their inner world so much as by the outer pressures that are bearing down upon them, right? As you describe, I mean, I, I've gone through periods where, you know, I, I found it difficult to get any kind of work, right? And man, it's amazing how that can diminish your sense of self-worth and send you on a downward spiral really quickly, right? Even with the privileges and skill sets and all those things that I've always had available to me, that happens to me. And so, of course, you understand, wow, you, you, you put the kind of, the, the kind of um, you know brutality and 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 lack of privileges and, or lack of good fortune that other people often can end up in in their lives for one reason or another often that had nothing to do with their own decisions but how their parents treated them and things like that or how society did you know you realize what people are up against and yeah we just need far more sympathy and understanding and true compassion and I say really true understanding because you have true understanding of what it's like to be suffering at the kind of scales you and I are talking about right now, then your whole orientation changes, right? You're okay. I understand. Right. And that could be me if, even if it's not me right now. And so what does that mean? And how does that change my orientation? And unfortunately that understanding doesn't seem to be widespread in our society right now. We need a lot more of that. And, and, and the, 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 all the different ways there are to help one another find value um, and superpowers in our experiences. Many of these psychiatric designations are actually connected to where people are having some kind of healing crisis where um, for, for, for decades or centuries, man, many cultures, many different places, people would have challenging experiences. They would have something that might be called psychosis or schizophrenia. They'd move through it creatively. They'd learn something about themselves in the world that they'd be supported by their families and communities to, to unfold whatever spiritual or existential experience they're having. And they would level up um, they they would find themselves stronger and more stable for their families and communities and for themselves than they had ever been in their lives. But that that has been wiped out in a lot of ways. So I I I think all of us feel it's our job to restore it. Absolutely, um, I'm so glad we're talking about it. Yeah, absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree too. And I often reflect on my own life that way too, because I, I look back now and go, I, I had a, a really good circle of creative, artistic friends in high school when I was going through some of the most difficult uh, stuff I was, you know, have ever gone through. And, and yeah, and so it's just, they were people that just had really open minds and we, we could talk about anything with each other and, and we weren't psychiatrizing each other or calling the police on each other. And also I was learning avenues of expressing that. I'd be like, you know, they either they would do something like, you know, they'd be depressed about something happened in their lives and they turn it into a song and, and it'd be like this beautiful ballad of sadness, you know, and I'd be like, wow, like that's beautiful that you did that to me and it would inspire me as well. Like, how can I channel these energies? How can I express them in different ways and provide opportunities, right? And, and so so I see now too that, you know, because I did get then reinforcement, you know, I, I, I kind of got good at a couple things and people went, hey, you're good at this. And then eventually I could make money from it. So these opportunities really reinforcing it and strengthen it over time, right? And even though I've never become famous or become rich, it was enough, right? To allow me to really get through a lot of that stuff and feel like today I have a fairly resilient sort of mindset overall when I'm struggling. And I feel uh, it, it breaks my heart at times when I hear other people's journeys and stories. And I realize you just didn't have that, right? For this reason or that reason, whatever reason, you know, you, you, you were on your own and, and when something came up for you that was really weird and difficult you didn't know how to understand it and around people around you suddenly started saying you're crazy or you're wrong or you're this and abusing you or just criticizing you or just not supporting you or whatever and then it went further and further and then you didn't get opportunities right and, and suddenly it became nothing but a negative experience and I think that's so sad because often you know the, that original triggering event and some people really did have that in their lives they can point back to you know Know, when I was 12 years old, this thing happened. Uh, maybe it was a traumatic experience or just a really unusual one that sort of started down a path. And I realized right then, you know, you know, often that was the case. They just didn't have the frame that would allow them to process it, right? To move through it and turn the negative into something that could be more 
positive and affirming for them as people growing in their lives and get those opportunities. Yeah. Uh, so I agree wholeheartedly that we need to talk about this more and we need to reopen our society to what does it mean to be in distress and how can we support each other and what are creative and engaging ways that these kinds of energies can be moved through and, and when they really are just negative, like what does that mean and how can we still support each other then, right? All these things are, are really legitimate questions. Thank you so much for providing so much crucial context in your book for what allows us to build positive healing frames like like you're talking about, like I'm talking about. Um, it, it's a it's a really wonderful basis for the work we're already doing in the intuitive network. And I feel so lucky I got to get on this call with you today. We didn't know if it would work. We did we didn't know if something would derail it. Um, so I, I'm very grateful about that. And um, I, I would like to continue our conversations recording whenever whenever we find we can do that again. I'll talk with groups about about if if there may be others who might be able to join us. I think that would be really wonderful. Um, could you uh, could you share where people can find your work online and how people can support you? Yeah. And I just want to respond quickly to what you just said, too. Like, absolutely. I'd love to talk with you more. It has been super great. And, and you've helped educate me on these issues already. And I want to thank you for our previous conversations and, and for this kind of work. And yeah, I invite anybody listening out there. I, I hope they will, you know, whether they're able to jump on a call with us or just send in a question one way or another that they'd like answered and that would be really really exciting and and or to share something that they want to share uh to help you know to help educate me and us and the world out there like uh, i'd love to hear more things about it because yeah it's definitely you know some of the the more extreme circumstances that we've touched on today are, are not things that I've directly experienced. And so I really rely on people to, to educate me more. And I know that my, my book, unfortunately, doesn't even cover that. I, I only covered stories where I could get clear, objective verification of some of this stuff through court cases and things like that. So I know even I left off stories where I went, I believe that, I believe it's real, but I just don't have enough other evidence. So I'm just going to leave it out of the book for now. But, you know, as we work together maybe we can gather some more of that and, and cover some of those kinds of stories more and some of them are just too heartbreaking too so anyway to, to to wrap up i'll just say people can reach me through my website which is my name robwhitepon.com there's a page there about the book too and you can learn more about it and yeah i, I want to emphasize that there is an epub version of the book so you, you know if you have site issues you can make the there's a Kindle version as well. You can make the print bigger and, and so on. There's an audio version as well, if you find that easier. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And cool. in fact, yeah, like, uh, um, it, and it not uncommonly goes on sale. Um, so like, I don't control that. Um, Amazon does. So, but yeah, if people are interested, you know, they can sign up for my newsletter at, at my website. It's free. And I, I it's, I don't deluge with you stuff. I, I don't get them out very often, but I, I'll always get them out when there's a sale on and people can often get like half off of the, the audio version too. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I can offer right now. And yeah, so people can reach me through my website. I'm on Twitter as well. If you're on social media, that's the most active place. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram a little bit right now. And you can email me through my website at any time. There's a contact page there. Great. And we'll, we'll include links on the page where this video goes up also. Great. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you for making this time for us today. And thank you for the, 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 the amazing nutrients of the conversation moving forward from here. It means a lot to me and it means a lot to us. Thank you. Uh, it means a lot to me to, to have that kind of support. You know, it's one of those things, wow, like people like you are kind of supporting me and empowering me in my day. So I want to, whatever I can do to kind of give back that, that, you know, support to, to your listeners and to you as well. I hope the book provides that. I, you know, I have to warn people that it is dark. Some people don't get through it because they're getting, you know, re responding to every page. I understand that. So don't feel compelled to read the book, but some people find the opposite, that it's very affirming 
to see themselves reflected or stories and experiences like that. And there's lots of people interviewed in there who've been through these experiences, you know, who I try to hold up and, and, and validate their experiences by look, you know, delving into their medical records and talking with them and talking with others and sort of to, you know, to help validate how they saw their experience as well. So yeah, that's there for people, but it is, it can be a hard read. I understand people tell me. <laughs> and for, for anyone who, who is experiencing it as a hard read or, or who is nervous about, about reading it, nervous about starting reading it, or maybe you start reading it and you're not sure that you can handle the content, we are coordinating group conversations in the Intuitive Network, usually on Telegram, although if somebody can't reach Telegram, I'm still interested to know if, if we can support them. Um, this, a bunch of us are talking about it in the ways that we can, and so I'm very interested in helping people connect to, to conversations that create safe spaces to talk about the parts of it that we can talk about together so that somebody's not trying to process it alone, um, and that can be really helpful too. So um, I, I, I have I, I plaster my contact information everywhere. So I'll put that also um, on the great. post that is associated with this video and the audio that goes out. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I may finally have to buckle down and buy myself a smartphone. I've been avoiding it all these years because I don't want to be swept up in the, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> When you told me you didn't have a smartphone, I thought, wise man, wise man, um, just be, just be careful, just be careful. Yeah, well, I have yes. to go traveling, yeah. and it's so hard to travel now without one, right? You just like, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think I might have to soon, but the positive will be that I could be on Telegram as well, and maybe we oh, can have. I would love that, and others would love that too. Um, this is, I mean, how, however it happens, smartphone or not smartphone, telegram or not te telegram, what we're talking about is this is this is relationship building. This is how we build relationships with one another and and we we care about and respect one another. And the more we can model that in the world we're in right now, the better. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. It's been lovely speaking with you. Have a wonderful day. I'll talk to you soon.